This is part 13 of a 14-part series on the unfolding revelation of God. Our subject is Genesis 126, always a last resort for Trinitarians, who seem to feel that when all else fails, Genesis 126 at least is a clear proof text for the Trinity. I find this amazing since Trinitarians insist that the Trinity is a New Testament revelation. Yet when they need one main text to show a positive divine plurality, they always seem to go back to this Old Testament passage, apparently realizing there aren't any clear New Testament ones. Now this passage has been used widely by Trinitarians as an argument to show that God is more than one person. The essential point is based upon the pronoun us found in the verse. The explanation given commonly is that God the Father is speaking to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, saying, let us, three plural persons, do thus and so, and typically they point out that the Hebrew Elohim is plural too. The verse says, and you all should turn there so you can read it in your Bible, Genesis 126, and God said, now, that word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. And you'll remember we learned that that word is plural. Now, it's a plural of majesty, which means it is an intensified word for God. It's not a numerical plural. It's a plural of intensity or magnitude rather than a plural numerically. Numerically, it is to be interpreted singularly, and I argued that point in the last lecture. Now, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. The explanation that this word God, Elohim, refers to God the Father, and he is addressing God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, saying, Let us, three members of the Trinity, work together to create man, is a poor argument for a number of reasons. Here are the reasons it's a poor argument. Number one, it contradicts all of the general tenor of the Scripture on the Godhead. The general tenor of the Scripture is that God is one. That is specifically stated six times. Moreover, the tenor of Scripture is that God is one. God is not more than one person. That will not be found in the Bible. The word person is not used for God. The word persons is not used for God. And the word three is not used for God. Therefore, you cannot use this Bible to teach that God is three persons. That is not anywhere found in this Bible. The flavor of the Bible is that God is one. And any uh, interpretation that contradicts that will be found to be an error. The second reason it's a poor argument is that it contradicts the context. Specifically, the next verse, verse 27, which is singular. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image, verse 27. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Notice, if God is an us in verse 26, why is God a he in verse 27? There's something wrong here if God is said to be an us in verse 27, and then God is said to be a he in verse 27. Excuse me, he said to be us in 26 and he in verse 27. We do not believe that if Elohim is used with a plural pronoun, that proves the Trinity, that it could be so because verse 27 has Elohim used with a singular pronoun, he. If Elohim with us means God is more than one person, then Elohim with he, by the very same argument, would mean Elohim is only one person. The plural pronoun us can't prove the Trinity, because the singular pronoun he in verse 27, by the very same argument, would disprove the Trinity. 
So this cannot be used as proof. Besides, if the word let us refers to a council of the Trinity to make man in their image, then the result of the discussion was dissension because God the Father didn't do what he himself suggested at the meeting. He said, let us do this. And the next verse says, so God created man in his own image. He didn't create them in the images, plural, of many different persons of God. Notice, let us make man in our image. What happened? God created man in his own image. Now that is not what verse 26 says. Verse 26 says, God suggested, let us make man in our image, plural. But that didn't happen. Verse 27 says, God created man in his own image. In other words, if that word God is God the Father in verse 26, then that word God is also God the Father in verse 27. And verse 27 has God the Father creating man in his own image. And God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were not involved at all. So we don't believe that's a good interpretation. The third reason it's poor is because it's unreasonable for three divine persons to hold a council anyway. This violates God's attribute of omniscience. If God is omniscient, knowing everything, it would not be necessary for him to suggest something to one of the other persons of the Godhead. They wouldn't have to have a meeting. He certainly wouldn't need to ask anyone else since he knows everything. This also would violate his attribute of omnipotence. Since he wouldn't need anyone else's help, having all power, he wouldn't need to confer regarding creating anything. Besides, if the Trinitarian description of three persons is true, they wouldn't need to exchange ideas or make decisions since all three persons are perfectly of one mind and will and agreement on everything in the first place. Now, if Trinitarians retreat and claim the passage is figurative, then they cannot use it as proof for a literal three persons, since a literal discussion among them never occurred. That would be the basis of the argument were it claimed to be figurative. The fourth reason is the Trinitarian interpretation violates Hebrew grammar. The word us is not plural in order to agree with the plural noun Elohim as alleged. It is argued the word God is plural, therefore the pronoun us is plural to indicate a divine plurality. That is not true. Hebrew grammar and usage always uses singular pronouns, adjectives, and verbs with the plural Elohim when referring to the true God. If you ever have a plural pronoun used with the plural noun Elohim, in other words, if it ever says Elohim, we, Elohim, they, plural, Elohim, us, rather than Elohim, he, Elohim, I, Elohim, me, which are all singular, if you ever see God and then us or they or we or something like that, it always refers to heathen gods. It means God and somebody else, it, since it is a plural of majesty. Now, I will take a few seeming exceptions to this later. The only time Elohim has a plural pronoun is when it refers to polytheistic heathen gods in the plural. The word us does not mean God the speaker is a plurality. When someone says, let us do this, he never means that he himself is a plurality. We deny this. When you say the word us, it doesn't mean you're a plurality. When God said us, it doesn't mean he's a plurality. Us always means the speaker and somebody else. It never means that he himself is a plurality. In other words, we would say uh, the word us, God never calls himself us. That's what I'm trying to say. God always means himself and somebody else by the term us. If Elohim is the reason for the plural us in verse 26, then why isn't Elohim the reason for a plural us in verse 27, verse 28, verse 29, and the rest of the New Testament and Old Testament? There are only four places in the Bible where God said us, and we're going to look at all four of them. 
And he never means I am a plurality, us persons of the Godhead. Because thousands of times in the Bible, it says God, he, God, I, God, me, I am God. And there is none else. There is none beside me. That's the flavor of the Bible. Now, if you ever find a case where there are thousands of things one way and four cases that are another way, the wrong thing to do is say the four things are the way it is and we'll interpret the thousands in light of the four. Now, that's absurd. You would never do that on any other subject. And so we say, if God calls himself I and me and he, etc., all through the Bible, he's never going to call himself us in four places. He's not an us. He's I. He's me. He's he. God is one. Therefore, God never calls himself us. And this must be God and somebody else. Now, the allegation that the plural pronoun us refers to the Trinity is also denied by a great host of Trinitarians. This would be our fifth argument against the Trinitarian interpretation. For example, Reverend Dumelow in Dumelow's Bible Commentary and Gray and Adams in Gray and Adams Bible Commentary. They specifically say that Genesis 1.26 does not refer to the Trinity. Now, if it were a clear proof text, then every Trinitarian scholar would seize the opportunity to use it. Despite the fact that most Trinitarian pastors would use Genesis 126 to prove the Trinity, the majority of Trinitarian scholars do not. The men that Trinitarian ministers look to as the authors of the authoritative literature on doctrine, etc., the theological doctors who write books they deny this. They contend that Elohim is a plural of majesty, and in this case, it does not refer to the Trinity. Now, of course, you will find those who disagree with that and say that it does. The Trinitarian assumption, its interpretation, is really an assumption. This would be my sixth reason. Since neither the text itself nor the context tells us who the us is, Nowhere in the Bible do you read of three persons of God getting together and deciding anything. God always does everything by himself. He never gets together and decides upon a course of action by conferring with other people. The context doesn't mention a trinity. Uh, the context only mentions God. You would have to already believe in a trinity in order to get that out of that verse. Because if you start in Genesis 1.1, it simply says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you've got God. And verse 2 says, the Spirit of God, that would mean God is a spirit. The Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. Verse 3, God said. Verse 4, God saw the light. Verse 5, God called the light day. Verse 6, and God said. Verse 7, and God made. Verse 8, and God called. Verse 9, and God said. And God, and God, and God, and God. You've got a story about God. Nothing in here says God is a number of persons. Now, when you get to verse 26, it said, God said, let us make man in our image. God is one. There's just one God, and that God is one. Now, when God said, let us, it means God is talking about himself and somebody else. Now, we'll define who that somebody else is in a few moments. Another argument is that the Trinity was unknown to Jews and Christians in apostolic times. The term wasn't even invented, wasn't even invented until the 3rd century by Tertullian. And the formulated doctrine was developed between the 3rd and 5th centuries in ecumenical church councils of the Roman Catholic Church. So this interpretation of Genesis 126 was unknown until the Trinitarians developed it. You see, the Jews had the Old Testament for a long time, almost 2,000 years, and they never interpreted Genesis 126 that way. And they were the custodians of the word of God. They interpreted it, they taught it, they believed it, they preached it, they stood for it, they defended it, they translated it, they preserved it. Under them were committed the oracles of God, the word of God. They never read a trinity into this passage. There isn't any trinity in this passage. That's a late date invention by Trinitarians. 
Moreover, we would argue, uh, in the eighth case, God alone created. A trinity of persons did not create anything. There are a number of passages that say that God is the creator by himself. These passages would be Malachi 2.10, Hath not one God created us? And Isaiah 44.24, which says, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord, or Jehovah, that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Now you see how that's singular? I am Jehovah, not us. I am Jehovah. And he says, I did it all alone. Alone means that Genesis 126 doesn't mean there's several of them doing it. This verse in Isaiah is just as inspired as Genesis 126. And you can't interpret Genesis 126 to say several persons of God did it if Isaiah 44:24 says Jehovah did it alone by myself. So we argue that God alone created. Uh, a trinity of persons is not involved in Genesis 126. Now, we believe that this is a very poor interpretation to say that Genesis 126 refers to the trinity. Well, what then does it mean? There have been five explanations given by people as to what this means. The first explanation is that it refers to three persons of God. We've already looked at that a little bit, and I'll be dealing with that more later. The second possible interpretation is that Elohim is asking angels to share in the creation. Since we know God is not three persons, God is not talking to another two persons of God. He created everything alone, by himself, Isaiah 44, 24, therefore this is not talking about that. When God said us, he means himself and somebody else. Who is the somebody else? Well, it has been postulated that the somebody else is the angels. Some say God said, let us make man in our image. In other words, God himself alone and the angels. Now, we don't believe that's a good interpretation either. Angels are not gods. They do not have the power of creation. Do you remember we said there's only one who is God by nature? And we quoted that passage in Galatians 4, 6. What is one of the attributes of God? He is the creator. That's what makes him God. Now, if anyone has the power of creation, they are deity by definition. And angels are not gods. Therefore, they do not possess creative power. We conclude, therefore, that God is not saying, let us. Me, God, who has the power of creation, and you angels who don't, let us make man. They're not going to make man. They don't have the power of creation to do that. Besides, the verse in 126 says, let us make man in our image. Now notice that it says our image. That means my image as God and your image, whoever the somebody else is that he's talking to. It doesn't say in our images, I have an image and you have an image that's different from mine. Let us make man in our images. It doesn't say that. It says let us make man in our image. That means that God and this other person or persons share the one same image. Now, that would mean that when they made man, they would make man into the image that God has and the other person has. Let us make man in our one image that we share, in other words. Now, we would argue that angels are not said to be in the image of God. Therefore, it would not refer to angels. Moreover, if this is true, that God was talking to the angels, the angels disobeyed and refused to accept their proposal. Because verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image, and God did it by himself, and the angels didn't. Now, we don't believe that fits. We know God created by himself, Malachi 2.10, hath not one God created us. A third interpretation is that the word us is a plural of majesty. Now, this is a poor interpretation. Uh, this would be, and God said, let us make men in our image. 
The word Elohim is a plural of majesty, and the word us is a plural of majesty. Therefore, us is actually singular in sense, even though it's spelled in the plural in Hebrew. Uh, we don't believe that. That doesn't make sense, and it doesn't fit Hebrew grammar. That would make the verse a heightened plural of majesty, because Elohim is already a plural of majesty. To add another plural of majesty would be to magnify a plural of majesty that's already there. Uh, this would be inconsistent because then the plural Elohim becomes the reason for both of two opposite things. Elohim is the reason that it says us as a plural of majesty to heighten it in verse 26, but then Elohim would have to be the reason for the singular pronoun he in verse 27 to show one God. And that doesn't make sense. Moreover, Elohim is already a plural of majesty. So you don't need a plural pronoun to heighten it. If there's a plural pronoun, it's there for a reason. It's not there to magnify God. God's already magnified by the plural of majesty inherent in the word Elohim. Moreover, that wouldn't explain why that plural pronoun appears here but not elsewhere. In other words, some might say, well, it's a plural of majesty to glorify God because it's right in the context where God is creating all these wonderful things, including man. And when it gets to where he creates man, it has an extra plural of majesty because it was such a wonderful thing for God to have the power to create man. And so God did it to glorify God. Well, that doesn't explain why in other passages that are just as wonderful about God, describing the same thing, creating the world and creating man. And it says Elohim did it and Jehovah did it, like Isaiah 44, 24. If God added an extra plural of majesty to give himself glory because it's talking about creating, why doesn't it do that in the other passages that also use Elohim and Jehovah and are talking about creating man? It should to be consistent, but it does not. Therefore, this doesn't fit. You'd think it would be there, though, because of what this passage itself is saying. And the other reason we reject this third idea is that a better explanation exists. Now, the fourth interpretation is the interpretation always given by Jews through history. Since they did not believe God was a trinity, they had to have some explanation for this. And they said, although God needed no one to help him in creating... In order to show humility, he likened himself to a king in counsel with others, confiding in his court. In other words, God likened himself uh, to a king who says, let us do this. You know, what should we do in our great, mighty, powerful kingdom here in uh, India or whatever? whatever. And uh, so the king says, let us do this in this great, powerful kingdom that I run speaking just out there to all the angels and everyone in the future, uh, in our great kingdom, we will do this. Meaning, I'll actually do it myself, but I'm speaking like a king would to his heavenly court. Uh, we don't believe that's a good interpretation because it's not in accord with the tenor of Scripture for God to humble himself. There's not one Scripture in the Bible that mentions anything about God actually humbling himself. Now, there is one passage that says, God humbles himself to behold the heavens and the earth. But that's not because he's actually humbling himself. That's just to show how great he is. <laughs> because it, you know the vastness of the universe. And God said he has to humble himself to even look at the thing and consider it. That, the fact that he has to humble himself to behold the heavens and earth is not really humility. That shows how great he is. So certainly God never humbles himself. Uh, moreover, conferring or counseling with someone else again degrades his omniscience. In Isaiah 40, verse 13, uh, we see an example of this. Certainly God does not need to talk to anybody to decide what to do. Nothing in the context indicates this because there isn't anybody else mentioned other than God himself. Therefore, we look for another interpretation. Now, the fifth interpretation, which I believe is the right one, I will call prophetic interpretation. Here is the fifth possibility. This makes the most sense, and it ties the entire Bible together, 
And it's a marvelous, wonderful prophecy in the book of Genesis of the coming of Jesus Christ. When God said, let us in, make man in our image, he was speaking prophetically to his son, the man, Jesus Christ, indicating that God would work with Christ to ultimately make man into the image and likeness of God. God was here speaking prophetically and anticipatively of his son, Jesus, the last Adam, who, working together with God, his heavenly father, would make fallen man back into the image and likeness of God. God's actual intent and plan of making man in his image and likeness would come to pass only after God manifests himself in the flesh in Jesus Christ. The initial creation of God, of man, was done by God alone. But after Adam was created by God, he fell. And ever since that fall, God has been working to restore and make. Notice the difference between create and make. God has been working to make man back in, <clears throat> excuse me, into the image and likeness that he had at the beginning. Notice what verse 26 says. God said, let us make man. Notice that word make. In our image, after our likeness. Now, what did God do immediately to make man in the Garden of Eden? Notice what verse 26, 7 says. So God created. Created is a different word than make. God said, let us make man. Verse 27 says, God created man in his own image. Now, notice that it doesn't say anything about the likeness in verse 27. The Bible does not say God created man in his image and in his likeness. That didn't happen. Verse 26 is prophetic. Verse 26 is talking about something future that would happen way down in time. God said, let us, let me, God, and you, the man Jesus Christ, Way down in time, me and you working together will make man into the image of God. Now, how does that happen? It happens this way. God's intent was to have sons of God in the image and likeness of God. The first step in that plan was to create a universe and an earth and to make man on it. God himself did that. God made the universe, God made the earth, and God created Adam. God did that alone. That's what verse 27 is saying. So God created man in his own image. Now that happened instantaneously by God himself alone in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1:27. That was the first step. If God wants a whole bunch of humans to love him and be sons of God, in order to have that plan accomplished, he's got to create a place for them and make the first pair to get the thing started. Now, God did that by himself, according to verse 27. He created Adam in the image of God. And we believe that after Adam was created by God in the image of God, he started to make Adam into what he wanted Adam to be. He started molding Adam and working on Adam. And as Adam fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden, he became more and more like God. That's what likeness means. Making is, happens over a process of time and involves labor. Creating is instantaneous and out of nothing. God created Adam instantaneously out of nothing. Having created Adam, he began to work on him, to make him into what he wanted him to be. That's what this passage is talking about. The initial creation of man was done by God alone. But Adam fell partially, both from the image and the likeness he originally had. So God instituted a plan centered in Jesus Christ of finishing having sons of God in the image of God. The initial creation of man wasn't enough because of the fall. 
in order to accomplish his ultimate goal of having millions of humans be sons of God and love God, it was necessary for God to work over a process of time to make fallen man into what he wanted him to be. But God never worked alone. He had to use Jesus Christ to die for our sins in order to make man into what he wanted us to be. Therefore, way back in the beginning, the Bible says God declares the end from the beginning. Way back in the beginning, he knew what it would take to redeem fallen man and make man into what he wanted man to be. It would take the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so God said, let us, me God, and you Christ, Way down in history, you will die on the cross. And me, God, and you, Christ, will make man into our image over a process of time by labor and working. Now, Genesis 1.26 foretells the entire plan of God in germ seed form. Now, how are we to check whether this interpretation is right or not? Genesis 1.26 and 27 speaks of making and creating man in the image and likeness of God. Hermeneutics dictates that we go to other verses in the Bible that speak about creation and let Scripture interpret Scripture. Parallel passages which use the words create and make and image, etc. should give us additional data. Indeed, the New Testament supplies information not stated in the Old Testament. And by comparing Bible with Bible, or spiritual things with spiritual, we can learn how Genesis 1, 26 and 27 was fully accomplished. We'll see that it is through Christ that God creates and makes man. God's actual intent of making man in his image is centered in Christ Jesus, the last Adam. Jesus was the first of a new order of men, men who would be made in the image and likeness of God. The first Adam and his seed fell and were sinful. They were not what God wanted. But the last Adam, Jesus, did not fall. He never sinned, and he was exactly what God wanted. He was fully and perfectly in both the image and likeness of God. So God is patterning all men after Jesus Christ now, rather than after the first Adam. Why would God do that? Because Jesus was the perfect image of God. Now, if Jesus is the perfect image of God, and you are made like him, what are you made into? The image of God. If he's the image of God, and you are made into what he is, you are made into the image of God. And Genesis 1.26 will be accomplished. Now, I want to look at some general parallel passages for this interpretation. First of all, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. We believe that since Genesis 126 talks about creating man, making man in the image of God and the likeness of God, that we should look up verses that use the word create and make and image and likeness. Those are the parallel passages in the Bible on this subject. And when you do that, you'll see that it's through Christ that God accomplished this plan. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam, a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man, he means Adam, is of the earth, earthy. The second man, he means Jesus, is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Now notice verse 49. And as we have borne the image, see that word image? That means this is a parallel passage to the one in Genesis, because they both use the word image. As we have borne the image of the earthy, that means the first Adam, the actual Adam in the Garden of Eden, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now that means Jesus Christ. Jesus is the second Adam, the last Adam. Look back at verse 45. The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, that's Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. 
So it's saying, just like we bore the image of Adam, in other words, we are physical men here on the planet, we've all fallen, we've all sinned, we are also someday going to bear the image of Jesus Christ. We will be made into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, why would God want to do that? Simply because Christ didn't fall and he was perfect. He was the type of Adam or man that God wanted in the first place. God originally wanted humans, people, men, to be sons of God and perfectly obey God, sinlessly and love God. But Adam fell from that. He wasn't what God wanted. Now Christ fulfilled it completely. He was exactly what God wanted. And therefore, God is working now to make men into what Christ was. Therefore, if Christ is the image of God and you're made into what Christ is, you're made into the image of God and Genesis 126 is fulfilled. What verses say Jesus is the image of God? Well, there are a number of them. Uh, one of them would be Galatians 4.4, 4, and we'll be looking at some other ones later. Also, Colossians 1.15. If we are made into him, therefore we are made in the image of God. By the way, the New Testament word image involves both the image and the likeness mentioned in Genesis. The Greek word image is icon, E-I-K-O-N. Icon covers both the Hebrew word selem, T-S-E-L-E-M, which means image, and the Hebrew word demuth, D-E-M-U-T-H, which means likeness. So when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, Genesis 126, and he mentions both the image and the likeness, the New Testament uses one word, image, icon, to cover both of those concepts. So that when we are made into the image or icon of Christ, that includes both being made into the image and the likeness. Now this verse here in 1 Corinthians 15 shows that God isn't through with us yet. Because it says we have borne the image of the earthy, but we will future bear the image of the heavenly. God isn't done. He's still making you into something beyond what you are right now. We have yet to attain the image of the heavenly. All, all men have the image of the natural Adam, but only some have come to Christ to have God do the second deeper spiritual work within of making them in the image and likeness of God. The first is outward, and it's the result of the natural birth. The second is inward, and it's the result of your new birth or being born again. Christ is the image of God. Romans 8.29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. 1 Corinthians 15.49, the verse we are on, as we have borne the image of the earthy, so we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, next verse is 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's another parallel passage to Genesis 1.26. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, when you were saved, you probably memorized that verse. The word creation, cre creature here, means creation. Notice that. If any man be in Christ... He is a new creation. Now we're talking about how man is created and how man is made. You know when you were really created also? Was when you got saved. When you got saved, you were created in Christ Jesus. That's what Genesis 126 is talking about. When it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then it says, so God created man in his own image. That's talking about the whole process. God created man in his own image is just the first step. That's when God made Adam in the Garden of Eden. But Adam sinned. So God had to work and use labor over a process of time and make man into that. Part of that process is when you become created in Christ when you're born again. 2 Corinthians 5.17 you must become a new creation in Christ in order to have fellowship with God restored. All men in the old Adam are out of fellowship with God. 
God isn't making them into anything. He's not dealing with them at all. But it's God's intent to restore fallen man. In order to do that, men must come to Christ and have their fellowship with God restored. Then God can begin the inward process of making them into the image and likeness of God. Another parallel passage would be Hebrews 2, verses 6 through 8. This one says, But one in a certain place testified, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. And it set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. That saying, when God created man, God gave man dominion over the whole world. But when Adam sinned, he lost that dominion. Adam had dominion over the animals. Adam had dominion over all of creation. But when man sinned, all of a sudden, man no longer had that dominion. Uh, animals attack us now. Insects attack us. We're fighting a battle here to survive in the world. We don't have the dominion that we used to have over everything. But Jesus did because he never sinned. He's the last Adam. Remember that? Adam was the was. In the same position Adam was, excuse me, Jesus was in the same position Adam was before Adam fell. Before Adam fell, Adam had complete dominion and was sinless. Through the virgin birth, God gave Jesus Christ the same opportunity Adam had. He was born without a sinful fallen nature, like you and I have. He was the last Adam. He's another Adam again. And Adam had the opportunity to live sinlessly and have dominion. God gave Christ that same opportunity again. He is another Adam, born without a fallen nature, and he, he succeeded. He was victorious. He went through his life, and he never sinned, just like Adam could have at the beginning. And Christ had that dominion Adam could have had. Christ was the very first man to have the dominion God intended man to have. And through Christ's death on Calvary, God is able to work on us to make us like him, Christ. Now, when that is accomplished, then God can give us the dominion just like he gave Christ the dominion. Another passage would be Romans 8, verses 19 to 22. For the earnest expectation of the creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Now what is this saying? This is saying creation itself is still groaning and travailing. Because it is awaiting the final state of man. Man has not been made into what God wants man to be made into. Now, if Adam would have never fallen, we wouldn't be in this state. But because Adam fell, God has been working all through history to make man back into what God wanted him to be. But God doesn't do that independent of Christ. The only way God can work on you to make you back into what God wants you to be is if you come and get saved through the death of Christ on Calvary and restore your fellowship with God, then God can begin to work on you. This shows that man is not a finished product yet. Something more is to be done with man. Creation is waiting for mankind to be finished as a work of God. Another passage would be Ephesians 2.10. This one is very plain. It says, For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus. We are his work. This shows that the initial creation of man, Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, wasn't enough. God must work on us more to get us into what he wants us to be. We are his workmanship. That means we are items in his shop and he's working on us. And we are the work that he's producing. But Christ is involved in that new creation or making of man. Christ is the someone else that God was talking to when God said, let us do it. 
It means God and Christ, because you can't have God work on you unless you come to God through Christ. The Bible says that Jesus said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but through me. It is only through Christ that you have fellowship with God and you can become the workmanship of God. That's why it says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That passage back in Genesis, when it's talking about the creation of man and the making of man, how are you going to find out how that thing is really accomplished? By going to other passages that talk about the creating of man, the making of man, and the image of God. And I'm reading them to you right now. And this one says, we're created in Christ Jesus. That's got to be part of your theology. You can't say God did it all back there in Genesis. If the Bible says you're created in Christ, then Christ has a part in that plan. And we can't just deny it and say that it, he has no part. In fact, it says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Before ordained. You know what that means? That shows this to be the fulfillment of God's original intent in Genesis 1.26. In other words, God planned way before that you should fulfill this role. When did he plan it before? Way back in Genesis 1.26. God before ordained that you would be created in Christ and live for God in the image and likeness of God. That's what it's talking about. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. This one says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Another passage there that says that you are created in the image of Christ. And Romans 8.29. You couldn't ask for a better parallel passage to Genesis 1.26 than Romans 8.29. It says this, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, before Adam fell, God, by foreknowledge, decided upon a plan to have men conform to the image of his son. And that's precisely what Genesis 1.26 is saying. God had a plan way back in the beginning, and that plan was, Make men into the image of his son. Why? Because the son is the image of God. So if you're made into the image of the son, you're made into the image of God, and you are what God wants you to be. You see, that's what Romans is saying. Whom he did foreknow, that means God, way back in the beginning, he foreknew you. He knew you before he were, was created. Because he has omniscience. He has all knowledge. So from all eternity, God knew about Christ, God knew about you, God knew about this whole plan. God knew Adam would fall. Before he even created Adam, he knew Adam would fall. But he created him anyway. And those whom he foreknew, what did he do regarding those people he foreknew? He predestinated them to be conformed to the image of his son. That means way back here, God decided upon a plan to conform you to the image of Christ. That is what Genesis 126 is talking about. It, when God said, let us make man in our image, he means I have the image of God, and you, Christ, have the image of God, and you and me will work together. You die on the cross, and I will accept that sacrifice, and together you and I will make man into the image of God. I'm ordaining it, that everybody be conformed into your image. And if they are, then they will be in the image of God, because you are the image of God. <clears throat> We are to be conformed into the image of his son. We are being made into the image of God through Christ. And God prophesied this whole thing in Genesis 126 because of his foreknowledge. He knew it ahead of time. And last, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are changed into the image of Christ from glory to glory. So the conclusion is these eight parallel passages using the word create and image, etc. show that it is through Christ God creates us in the final sense. This is how you interpret the Bible. To find out what Genesis 126 means, you go to parallel passages in the New Testament. 
the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. One from the Old Testament adds weight to this also. Isaiah 46.10. Isaiah 46.10 says God declares the end from the beginning. Now, if God is omniscient and he knows the end from the beginning, and if that passage says he declares the end from the beginning, I want to know where and when did God declare the end from the beginning. The Bible says he did it. It says God declares the end from the beginning. Now, when did God do that? What you'd have to do is go back to the beginning of the Bible. You'd have to find a place back here where it says in the beginning, like Genesis 1. And you'd have to find something related to the beginning and find out a place where God declared the end way back here in the beginning. Now, you know where that is? It's in Genesis 126. That's where it is. Because here, God said, let us make man in our image. A prophetic statement by God's foreknowledge of what God would do in the future to accomplish his plan. Now, there are a number of specific parallel passages that I want to talk about. The first thing is uh, the work of Christ. The work of Christ. This verse, Genesis 126, is prophetic of Christ working with God to make man into the image and likeness of God. Did Christ work with God? That's the question I'm asking. I'm saying 126 says, God will work with Christ to make man into our image. Our image because they both share the one image. Did God work with Christ? Positively, Genesis 4.24, Jesus saith, excuse me, John 4.24, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Jesus was going to finish the work of God. What does that mean? God started it in Genesis 1.27, when he created Adam. But it wasn't finished, because Adam fell, and he never was what God wanted all the way. It took Jesus Christ to finish this plan. And that's what Christ said. John 5, 17. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. John 5, 36. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me. John 17, 4. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and guess what Christ said when he died on the cross? John 19.30 When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. John 19.30 What did Christ finish? You ever ask yourself that? When Jesus said, It is finished. What did he finish? He finished his part in the plan of God. When God said, let us do it, me, God, and you, Christ, Christ's part was to die on the cross. And when he finally died, he had finished his part in the plan. Now, <clears throat> we also would point out uh, that saints work with Christ. Christ in the body of Christ. This is a real revelation, and it takes uh, some insight to understand this. When God said, let us make man in our image, we believe that in a limited sense, in a secondary sense, this is certainly not the primary meaning of the passage, but in a secondary sense, we as the body of Christ work together with God to make man into the image of God. Do you know how you do that? You do that every time you witness to somebody and they kneel before Christ and give their life to Christ. And when you pray with them and counsel to them, what happens? The Lord works with you. The Lord is there working with you. Mark 16, 20. The Lord working with them with signs following. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are laborers together with God. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then as workers together with God. Galatians 2, 8. It is God's power working within me for the apostleship of the Gentiles. John 14, 12, the works that I do, you will do, and greater works shall ye do, because I go to my Father. 
That means we are working with God just like Christ was working with God. Revelation 1.6 says we are a kingdom of priests unto God. We are priests in that spiritual sense, and we work together with God. So we believe Genesis 1.26 refers to God the Father working together with the man Christ to make man into our image. Notice it doesn't say our images, plural, but our image, singular, meaning us two, you and me. We both share the same one image. We share it. We both have it. It's our image. Now, some Trinitarians assume that the term us refers to God himself, who is a trinity, revealing a plurality within the speaker. But us never means that in Hebrew or Greek or English. Us always means the speaker and someone else who is being spoken to. But that somebody else has to be somebody in God's image. Because it says our image. God never calls himself us. The plural pronoun us never indicates a plurality of persons in the one who's talking. It denotes the person speaking and the person or person spoken to. So Genesis 1.26 does not constitute proof that God himself is a plurality. It means God and somebody else who have one and the same image. Now, can we find someone else in the Bible besides God who is in the perfect image of God? The answer is yes. In the Bible, it is Jesus Christ. Our image, note the plural pronoun our and the singular noun image, Our image means God and the person to whom God is speaking share the same image. And Christ is the only person from Genesis to Revelation other than God who is said to be in the image of God. Colossians 1.15 Christ who is the image of the invisible God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 Christ who is the image of God. And Hebrews 1.3 Furthermore, there is precedent for this interpretation of Genesis 1.26, because other scriptures give evidence that God could speak prophetically to his son Jesus, who did not yet exist. There are other passages that show uh, God doing the same thing that he did in Genesis 1.26. Somebody says, well, how could God speak to Christ if you teach Christ didn't exist until he was born of Mary? Now, I mean the humanity of Jesus, the human person, the Son of God, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5. He didn't exist. How could God say back there, let us make man in our image? He can't talk to somebody who didn't exist. Now, there's a couple of answers to that. The first answer is, God dwells outside the realm of time. So, it doesn't really matter in the first place. But... That being aside, it is true that we have other examples of God speaking directly to somebody who didn't exist. This passage will be found in Isaiah 45.1. This is where God spoke to the man Cyrus, who did not yet exist. I'll read you the passage. Cyrus was not born for another 150 years. Thus saith Jehovah to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. Here God speaks to Cyrus and says plainly, I am talking to you. And yet we know historically Cyrus was not born for another 150 years. You could also put Psalm 2-7, Psalm 89, verses 26 and 27, and 2 Samuel 7-14 for other cases where God spoke to people and yet they did not exist. 